Another consequence of the COVID pandemic has been an epidemic of drugs and opioid-related deaths, which are up in more than 40 states, while many addiction treatment centers have been forced to shut their doors. Beth Macy is a veteran reporter on this beat in the United States, and she has written a book about it, and it's called Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company That Addicted America. Tackling this was an early Trump pledge, but Macy tells our Michelle Martin why she thinks Biden has a more coherent plan to end this suffering. Thanks, Christian. Beth Macy, thank you so much for joining us once again. It's great to be here, Michelle. I think people who are familiar with your, your powerful work in your book, Dope Sick, um, will remember that you've spent many, many years, in fact, decades, reporting on the development of the opioid crisis in this country. And last week, there was news. The Department of Justice announced an $8 billion settlement with Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, for its role in fueling the nation's opioid crisis. So would you just so briefly tell us, like, what is the allegation against, what is the, what is the argument that the Department of Justice made, and what, what was Purdue Pharma's role in fueling this crisis, as briefly as you can? So you might recall, and my book goes into great detail, that the government uh, proved that C Purdue had criminally misbranded the drug in its early years. So there was a settlement in 2007 for criminal misbranding, basically exaggerating the efficacy of the drug and downplaying the risks. And um, part of that settlement, they signed a corporate integrity agreement saying, you know, they weren't going to do that anymore and uh, they were going to abide by the rules. But what the Justice Department found out in their years long investigation was that they were providing kickbacks to healthcare companies. Um, a few doctors were paid bribes um, and it was uh, business as usual. Uh, they lied to the DEA. It seemed to be business as usual, and I think that, uh, Michelle, if you or I had committed such a heinous crime and pled guilty to it in 07 and then got caught doing that and worse um, two weeks before an election, which is worth pointing out, um, a lot of people think that this announcement was time to make President Trump look like he had a really good win against the opioid crisis. But I think if you or I had done that, we'd be in jail. And so when I interview the families that I've spent time with, when I talk to the mothers and the dads who have lost their families, the activists on the ground, the harm reduction workers in these uh, rural distressed communities, this doesn't look like justice to them. This looks like billionaires get to get away. Uh, does anybody, does anybody world. go to jail under the settlement? Nobody goes to jail under the settlement. The one silver lining is that it doesn't preclude further charges. The other big complicating factor, so you have these big headlines last week saying, win against Purdue, $8 billion, but really right now they're in bankruptcy court in White Plains. Like there was a hearing yesterday with Judge Drain, the bankruptcy judge, uh, about whether or not the Sackler family could take their 225 million fine from the company or whether it had to come from them and 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 this kind of stuff and it was real clear that the judge is going to be the ultimate uh decider on all of this so it's it's not going to be anywhere near eight billion and it's very clear that no one still is going to jail the parents are still holding out hope there's a couple um pretty aggressive attorney generals uh, leading the way. They're called non-consenting states, Moore Healy in Massachusetts, Letitia James in New York, and they say they are not giving up in this. And the parents are holding a lot of hope out for that. But uh, a lot of people who follow this story think it's a foregone conclusion that the Sacklers ultimately will get immunity from all of this. Um, the, the Sacklers they, being the family that owns uh, Purdue Pharma, the, the dominant shareholders in Purdue Pharma. Exactly. Yeah, it was a private, privately held company. They were clearly uh, holding the reins of the company, uh, uh, even in recent years. And, um, you know, they profited to the tune of 13 plus billion dollars. Obviously, if this is your life, if this is something you've been living with for all these years, then you know these facts very well. But for people who don't, just tell us the scope of the damage that's been done uh, because of the opioid crisis in this country. 
So we've lost uh, about 450,000 people to uh, opioid overdose deaths. And, uh, and, and, and what time about that? Is that? In what time? Uh, that's that? since uh, OxyContin was was first released uh, in 1996. And of course, so wait, wait, wait. So did... just in 1996, we've lost 450,000 since... people to, to overdoses, and not, we're not even talking about people who are living with ongoing addictions. Absolutely, right. we have about 2.6 million Americans addicted to opioids. But uh, counting heroin and fentanyl deaths and prescription opioid deaths, not just OxyContin, but others as well. Uh, we've lost 450,000 Americans. What that looks like on the ground is uh, what the company did early on was they targeted doctors who were already prescribing competing opioids with the news mm -hmm. that the FDA allows us to say we have this really, really strong opiate. And because it has this time release mechanism, it's safe to use. Well, we know it, well, they knew right away it wasn't safe to use. Uh, but they also flipped the narrative that opioids in general were safe for everything. So suddenly you had doctors prescribing, kids getting wisdom tooth surgery, OxyContin, um, TMJ, uh, osteoporosis, a lot of older folks uh, with chronic pain issues. And so they flipped the narrative with the help of pain societies that they also funded and doctors that they also funded to say, uh, to reverse the narrative that for a hundred years we knew that opioids were addictive and should only be used in severe pain, cancer, end of life. And now, of course, Beth, I have to ask you about the other crisis this country is dealing with, the one that is in the headlines every day, which is the coronavirus epidemic, which is a global sort of crisis. How has this, um, how have these two crises kind of affected each other? Has there been an effect of this, all the COVID-19 shutdowns and all the measures taken to address it have they had an impact on people who are already experiencing uh, the opioid crisis? Absolutely. It's just been devastating for uh, people with opioid use disorder. According to all of my sources, and I've got sources all over the nation, the, the national figure that came out this summer was that over su substance use overall is up 13% among everyone. That's all of us. But uh, opioid overdoses also up, have gone up 13%. Now, in the communities that I report from, which are largely distressed communities, um, my sources are telling me that overdoses are up 25 to 40% in some of these areas. And as the unemployment rate goes up higher, a lot of these folks, or service workers, um, a lot of their folks have, have lost their jobs their unemployment has run out. Um, the drug supply has been uh, changed because of issues at the border. And a lot of people have switched to methadone, or, or I'm sorry, to methamphetamine from opioids, but now it has fentanyl in it. So um, uh, they're not carrying Narcan because they're, they're not opioid users and they don't know it has fentanyl in it. And then they're dying from that. The fentanyl is very, very potent. And it's, it's literally cheaper than bottled water right now. Mm. So th that's what we're seeing. Um, one doctor who has uh, four or five MAT clinics, and he, he's really excited, especially at the beginning. He was like, Beth, this is the best thing. We should have been doing this for years. SAMHSA and the DEA relaxed the guidelines for initiating people on buprenorphine, which is the, the medication-assisted treatment that helps people, and, and methadone. And um, so all of a sudden they could do telehealth, even the initial call. And it was really good for people in rural areas that had a hard time affording gas money to get to uh, the clinic where they had to do their drug screen once a week and check in with the doctor. So he was now doing check-ins and he was so excited about it. He's like, oh, we should have been doing this for years. But now he started to see the impact of the economy and COVID on his patients. So where they were once in their homes or in their apartments, now they're in their cars mm. or they're in homeless encampments. And uh, you know, he said he'll see a little kid in the back seat uh, doing her school on Zoom. And a lot of these families will check into a motel on the weekend to, to take a shower. And then they have to go back to their cars and it's, it's really, really stressful on people right now. I mean, it's stressful on all of us, right? This is just, just a crazy time.
So Beth, could you tell us a bit more about who is most vulnerable during this pandemic? The people who are most vulnerable are those who are in active addiction because they have to have that opioid uh, in order not to be dope sick. And that's what they're chasing at this point. They're not chasing the high, they're chasing uh, not being in excruciating withdrawal. So they're the most vulnerable uh, to getting um, pills that have been pressed with fentanyl or methamphetamine that's been spiked with fentanyl. And that's why it's so important that they get um, access, low barrier access, to uh, methadone or buprenorphine. As I understand it, the Centers for Disease Control estimates that there have been something like 75,000, more than 75,000 overdose deaths in the 12 month period between March of 2019 and March of 2020, which is just an increase of 10%. If these patterns hold, forgive me for asking you to speculate, how bad could it get? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think it's gonna be our worst year ever. Uh, Trump touted like, you know, the 2018 data was a slight decrease in overdoses, uh, but, but 19 was up and this year is looking worse than ever. And uh, folks are working so hard. Um, you know, one, one recovery worker said, you know, I feel like we're just drowning here. What role though does economic pressure play in this? I mean, because one of the other points that you made is a lot of these, these this crisis kind of took hold in places that were already struggling. So what role does the economic pressure play in that? Yeah, it's a huge role. I mean, we still have a, only a third of the country has college degrees, right? And then in these communities where the factory work went away, very little was done to assuage uh, the damages in those communities. Um, I'm reporting from a rural town in uh, North Carolina right now that has the 10th highest rate of, um, it has one of the highest opioid overdose rates in the, in the state and in the nation, and uh, as well as hepatitis C. And when you dig down on their data, what they have is a really high correlation between opioid prescribing from the very beginning when Purdue had uh, uh, unleashed OxyContin and workforce uh, participation. So the places that have the lowest workforce participation right now, and you have some communities that have less than 50%, especially middle-aged males not working and uh, pushing the opioids at the same time. It was just, that was the special recipe for social disaster in those communities. So it's very much an economic story and um, a case of, um, I think we too often blame the drug users instead of placing the blame where it belongs on the, the lack of regulation, uh, uh, government regulation that allows something like this to happen. And as well as allows CEOs to close these factories and not do anything for the communities they've left behind because they were ch chasing a cheaper wage elsewhere and a bigger profit. And what are your concerns as this crisis continues, and as, as we are speaking now, there still hasn't been a second relief package. I mean, there was one earlier in the year where people uh, got some support and they got some enhanced unemployment benefits and things of that sort, but that those funds have lapsed and nothing Absolutely. has taken its place. So what are your concerns as this continues? Well, in these rural com communities where I report from, um, a, there are a lot of it's it's expensive to get on these medications for opioid use disorder. And a lot of folks are just going without, and that's when they're most likely to relapse and die. Um, and you, you're seeing homelessness, um, sex work uh, on the increase. Um, it, it's just a problem that's getting worse. And, and the people who are working in this population are, are really overwhelmed, they, they need help. Has this crisis been a part of our national conversation over the course of this election year? I just don't recall it being a very big part of our conversation. I mean, has it been? No, it hasn't been. And um, there's just so much crazy news coming out every hour. It hardly gets any attention. Um, I, I think the Trump administration has, has bungled the response to the crisis. There were, we didn't even have a drug czar for many years. Um, and, and the, the people high up were often political appointees. Um, 
he, there were uh, our, about $6 billion came down from the federal government during his administration. Uh, but there were there were so many other things that could have been done, including just a rallying call uh, around this issue. One of the easy things he could have done uh, or, or, you know, at the federal level could have been changed was to X the X waiver, which is this uh, bureaucratic requirement that makes it so that doctors who are going to prescribe buprenorphine have to get a DEA waiver. And it's part of the reason we only have 8% of doctors who are even willing to do that, which is why people are going to the black market for, for buprenorphine. Which is what? It's part of a medically assisted treatment program. It's the sort of the, yeah. the key to that. Yeah, and you're saying absolutely. very few doctors can prescribe it because they have to go right. through this long process to get authorization to, to, to do it. Yeah. And that would have been an easy fix. France did it uh, 25 years ago at the height of a heroin epidemic, and they reduced their overdoses by 79%. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of could have been done with regard to uh, law enforcement, um, taking people, having police, uh, you know, there's, there's, there are good examples in places like Burlington, Vermont, where they realized that every single overdose they had in 2018 was uh, somebody who had come into contact with police. So they start this program with the mayor and the city, uh, the mayor and the police chief and the head of the nonprofit hospital. And instead of arresting people when they find them with heroin, they literally drive them to treatment. And the police there told me like, you know, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to arrest the bad guys. And they realized as they got into this population and started spending more time, they weren't the bad guys. They were victims of this crisis too. And what about the Biden campaign? Does the Biden campaign have a, a coherent strategy to address this? Yeah, I really think he does. He, he, he says he put in 125 billion over 10 years and that he would scale up drug addiction treatment um, and other prevention programs paid for with higher taxes on uh, farmer profits, which sounds good to a lot of uh, these families. And he would try to slow the flow of drugs from the illicit flow of drugs from China and Mexico. Um, you know, he was one of the authors of some war on drugs policies in the 80s and 90s that really hurt uh, communities, particular communities of color. So I think this is his chance to give back and uh, to, to, to undo some of the damage that we still see uh, uh, no, by far larger numbers of people of color being incarcerated when we know that whites are use drugs at a higher rate. Beth Macy, thank you. Thank you.